All right, good morning and happy Sabbath. Let's have a word of prayer as we get started. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this Sabbath day. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to understand as we go through these topics that we'll be looking at today between Seventh-day Adventists, Latter-day Saints, and Jehovah's Witnesses. Thank you, Lord. Help us to find the truth. We need that faith that you promised to us. We need the white raiment, and we need the eye salve. So much today, Lord. Help us to have discernment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this sermon was uh, asked, I think, by a couple people um, uh, over a year ago. What's the difference between Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, and Seventh-day Adventists? All right, obviously we got some different logos here. This is not the uh, Seventh-day Adventist logo today, but what we're going to be talking about is uh, truth Seventh-day Adventism. That's what I'll be talking about when I say Seventh-day Adventists. And we'll be looking at the organizations of Jehovah's Witnesses and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and also known as the Mormons. So the reason for this sermon series is so often when we're passing out literature, doing evangelism, discussing Jesus in public, perhaps going door to door, the question arises, and I'm sure it's happened to every single one of you at some point or another, are you Jehovah's Witnesses or are you guys Mormons? I, uh, I think it was, uh, I think Rita and Paul, what they used to do was when they'd pass out books, they would have a stamp or something in there that said, we're not Mormons, so that the, they wouldn't immediately think that and then sort of whatever problems that they may have had with that church or perhaps their studies, um, that they immediately think were, were the same thing. Many folks quite often judge your efforts to evangelize based on the issues that they've had with these previous religions by subconsciously sort of lumping you in together. Yes, Rita, you want to say something? I just wanted to say, I'm sorry. Yeah, the mic's right there. Yeah, yeah. Just make sure it's on. When we used to hand it out, like you said, we stamped, we are not Jehovah Witnesses or Mormons. Right. We got a phone call from Mormons and said, well, you spelled Mormon wrong. It's M-O-R-M-O-N. And we spelled it M O R. M A N. I said that just proves that we're not Mormons. Exactly. We didn't even know how to spell it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Perfect. <laughs> Here's where the issue comes into play, though, right? Confusions arise even more when potential students begin doing their own research, right? Which that's not a bad thing in general to do your own research, but it, confusion arises when they begin doing their own research but they have mistaken the literature that you've brought to them for these other groups, and then they don't read them at all. It's these issues and more is the reason for this study. So we're going to look at what the differences are. And also, the Jehovah's Witnesses, these are, all, these are just my words here. The Jehovah's Witnesses, Latter-day Saints, and Seventh-day Adventists have some obvious things in common. They all claim to be God's true remnant last day church on earth. They all claim to have a special message and mission for the world different than other Christian churches. And they all sprang up about the same time in history. So today as we study, we're going to unpack the differences between these entities. And um, there's a lot. There's a lot of differences. So here are the, here are the, the way I've broken this down. And we're not going to get through all of these today. Uh, unfortunately, just looking at the origins of, of a group will take an entire study, So, if, to be fair to them. So today, we're going to be looking at the origins of the religion. We're going to be looking at the origins of the Mormon religion in particular today. The next time, we'll go over Jehovah's Witnesses, and then we'll go over Seventh-day Adventists, and we'll see how they stack up side by side. That's important to understand the differences between the religion. How did they spring up? Who are their founders? And what, what, were, the, uh, what were the movements of the fledgling church? Two, their authorities and or authoritative texts. Did they have a prophet? Do they have other 
uh, sources besides the Bible that they consider to be authoritative. That's something that we'll study and we'll look at and we'll unpack the differences. Then we'll look at their doctrinal differences. We have to look at their authorities first because we're not going to understand, we can't, we can't argue any doctrinal points unless we understand where they're getting those points from. So then we'll look at the doctrinal differences and then we'll look at their message to the world. That is, what, what is, what is the special message that they have to give to the world and see which ones are biblical and see which ones are not. Paul, you want to add something? Yeah, you know, it's funny, and of course, uh, Bill's uh, talk a little while ago, Mark Finley wrote a book that's very helpful, and uh, Bill, I'm sure you're familiar with this. I think he did it in the late 70s. I have it in my library, and I use it about doctrinal differences between us, and he names a bunch of religions and things in common, and it's used to strike up an evangel conversation and evangelize these very denominations. Mm. Now, the interesting thing is Finley lists all the differences. Isn't that amazing? And, you know, State of the Dead, the Sanctuary, of course, uh, all these things, Ellen White, but now he's denying all that. However, <clears throat> that book, and I can't remember the title of it, uh, is quite helpful, and it tells you all these differences. And it's been an Adventist fingertip since, I believe, the late 70s. Wow. Was that Vanderman? No, it was Finley's book. Finley. Okay. And uh, I forget, Rita might know the name of it, but it's just ironic to me he wrote that book, and now he's standing all that on its ear. Wow. And as far as Adventists not knowing this, you've got a book that was written a long time ago about it. It's kind of funny. Hmm. I guess they're not part of his three cosmic messages, huh? Yeah, that's pretty So their last message, uh, their message to the world. So, and you could, you could see a little bit of differences here. Now, all of them started out using the King James Bible. Some of them still do. Um, and then you have, with uh, Mormons, you have the Book of Mormon, Doctrines and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. That also became authoritative text, along with the prophet. Um, and then with Jehovah's Witnesses, you had the King James for quite a long time, and then eventually it was commissioned to write a new Bible to get rid of, well, what do they always say for the King James? To get rid of the archaic language, right? So that's what they did, and they made a New World Translation of the Scriptures. So that's eventually something we'll be looking at as well. So today we're going to be looking at we're going to be looking at Mormons, and we are going to be looking particularly at Joseph Smith and his life because the Mormons basically stand or fall on the testimony of this man, Joseph Smith. And so we will see what it, lo it looked like in his life and his ministry with this church up until his death in 1844. So to get started, we have the backdrop. The backdrop of all of these movements is something that was called the Second Great Awakening here in America. And this is what it has to say about it on History.com, The Great Awakening, um, written September 19th by the editors. The Great Awakening came to an end sometime during the 1740s, that's the first one. In the 1790s, another religious revival, which became known as the Second Great Awakening, began in New England. This movement is typically regarded as less emotionally charged than the First Great Awakening. It led to the founding of several colleges, seminaries, and mission societies. A third Great Awakening was said to span from the late 1850s to the early 20th century. Some scholars, however, disagree that this movement was ever a significant event. So, yeah, I haven't always heard very much about the third Great Awakening, which was in the mid-1800s. Uh, the, the mid but the Second Great Awakening, I've certainly heard about. And obviously, the Millerite movement was going on around that time right around the time of uh, 1825 and kind of moving up through there. There was, there was a religious revival movement throughout New England, especially, but also throughout other parts of the world. And all of that, all of that happened because the, the, and you start with 1790, right? All of that happened because the, the books of Daniel and Revelation were now open. Well, Revelation was always open, but Daniel was a big key to that. And Daniel was a sealed book that was now opened. 
And so there was people studying the prophecies around this time. And this is when all three of these churches came into being. They're all related to the Second Great Awakening. The Encyclopedia Britannica online says this about the Second Great Awakening. The Second Great Awakening, Protestant religious revival in the United States from about 1795 to 1835. During this revival, meetings were held in small towns and large cities throughout the country. And the unique frontier institution known as the Camp Meeting began. And we can testify to that as Seventh-day Adventists. We remember that. Camp meetings became a very popular way of reaching people. Many churches experienced a great increase in membership, particularly among Methodist and Baptist churches. The Second Great Awakening made soul winning the primary function of ministry and stimulated several moral and philanthropic reforms, including temperance and the emancipation of women. Generally considered less emotional than the Great Awakening of the early 18th century, which basically led into the, when it became to full maturity, the First Great Awakening led to the independence of the United States of America. Uh, the second wave of evangelical revivalism led to the founding of numerous colleges and seminaries and to the organization of mission societies across the country. And that's what you see. And you see, without kind of jumping too far down the rabbit hole about this, I will just say there was true religious revival going on and there was false religious revival going on at the same time. And they both were building their colleges and their universities to sort of combat each other. And so while the Second Great Awakening had this great religious revival movement in Protestant churches, not all of it was good, right? The devil sees when these things are happening, and he tries to take over the, the, the movement himself. And if he can't do that, he'll set up his own rival counterfeit. And that's exactly what happens in the Second Great Awakening. So let's start with the origin of Mormonism or the Latter-day Saints. Joseph Smith, he was born in 1805, and he died June 27th in 1844. He was born in Vermont. Joseph Smith's family was typical of many early Americans who practiced various forms of Christian folk magic. And you can find that from Michael Quinn's 1998 book, Early Mormonism and the Magical Worldview, second edition. This is page 30 and 31. That's a quote. So Joseph Smith's family actually practiced magic. They practiced forms of magic. And what is Christian folk magic or religious folk magic? According to Wikipedia, cunning folk magic, which is, is what it's also called, within the Latter-day Saints is described as follows. So this is something not only as religious folk magic in general, but something related directly to the Latter-day Saints and the early parts of the movement. Cunning folk traditions, sometimes referred to as folk magic, were intertwined with the early culture and practice of the, the Latter-day Saint movement. So the early Latter-day Saints were practicing folk magic, okay? And what is that? These traditions were widespread in the unorganized religion in parts of Europe and America, where the Latter-day Saint movement began in the 1820s and 1830s. Practices of the culture included folk healing, okay? That's like healing through um, um, chants and stuff like that, as well as folk medicine, uh, something like um, extreme forms of herbology and stuff like that, where they were using herbs to, to heal people, folk magic, and divination. And divination is when they would basically try to call upon God. If they were Christians, they would try to use these, these trants. They would put little burn some incense and stuff and they would try to they would try to get an answer from the angels or from God as if this is the way that we are we are taught to do this so they would practice forms of divination remnants of which have been incorporated or rejected to varying degrees in the liturgy culture and practice of modern latter day saints so joseph smith and his family were practicing uh, basically low-level forms of magic, and they continued to practice this 
throughout his entire span up until his death. And his followers also practiced Christian folk magic or religious folk magic. And they would use divination. They would use, uh, it, you know, sometimes this stuff could look very charismatic in, in form. Um, they would have trances. They would uh, uh, heal people through these special concoctions and stuff. Uh, and so this is what was going on in Joseph Smith's family um, and also within the Latter-day Saint movement. Now, what does the Bible say about practicing folk magic? Well, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 10 through 14, I think you're very clear on this. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times. That was one of the ways Christian folk music, uh, Christian folk magic music. Um, one of the things they did was they used divination. And here you, here you have it right here. The Bible saying, don't use that. There shall not be a found, found among you anyone that uses divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. So this is considered something that God, it's not just the sin. It's not just iniquity. It's something God considers to be an abomination to do. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God for these nations which thou shalt possess. Hearken unto observer of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God shall not suffer thee to do so. So, one of the things we have to remember here is that the Canaanites were removed from Canaan, and one of the reasons why is because they were practicing the same things that Joseph Smith and his family and that the early Latter-day Saints were practicing. Divination, folk magic. You know, it goes even a little step further if you go to Exodus chapter 22. In verse 18, it says, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. So it was considered a, a capital punishment offense to be involved in this type of stuff. But this was, and this is not, this is not something that's necessarily debated. This is something that is, that, that is accepted within uh, the Latter-day Saint movement, and they have, they have gone through and looked at different folk magic things that they've done, in the past and decided whether it was to be accepted or rejected in modern day latter day in the modern day latter day saints so it's something that's been a part of the movement before during and after the movement because the whole message hinges on their founder joseph smith paul oh, it's interesting too i mean where they lived it wasn't far from the fox sisters that yes. was in upstate new york yes. well anybody who knows that area Vermont and upstate New York are very close, and I will guarantee you they knew, well, in my opinion, they knew of or maybe knew each other, and they were in the same lines of religion because it's all spiritualism, no matter how you look at it. Exactly. And, and actually, it was not an uncommon thing, and it was not really something that was looked down upon. And that's why they called it Christian folk magic. Yeah. Right? And this is something that, it just goes to show you, this was the... This was the, uh, the cultural temperature of the area when the Millerite movement was going through, okay? So this is type of, some of the stuff you see early Adventists being very fanatical, who knows what they were doing behind closed doors, you know? Mesmerism was a big issue in Mrs. White's day that she had to deal with, that she required protection of angels where she actually called out during a meeting another angel to come and protect her from this type of stuff. So there's power here, folks. Dark power, but there's power. So let's move on to the vision of 1820. He was born in 1805, so 1820, he's still a young man. This is what it says. Remember now, remember, before, during, and even after his death, 
there are practicing magic in some form. Keep that in mind as I read this. His family was caught up in the revival movements of the day. Who knows? They probably heard some Millerites at some point. While praying one day, not in 1820, but maybe later. While praying one day in the woods, Joseph Smith received a vision of God the Father and Jesus Christ, who spoke with him directly and assured them that his sins were forgiven, and also told him that the contemporary churches had turned away from the, from the gospel. According to his testimony, he related the vision to a Methodist minister, but was not believed, so he kept to himself until many years later. So he didn't report that until many years later. And you can find that in the book called Joseph Smith, page 37 and 38, written in 2002 by Robert Remini. Now, think about this for a, seven, for, for a second. You have someone who is, who is practicing, whether they realize it or not, okay, that it's wrong. It's their privilege to know that it's right because they can read English and they have Bibles. You have someone who's practicing witchcraft. And while they're praying to God, right, because they're kind of straddling the fence between darkness and light here, they have a vision. And who comes in the vision? God the Father and Jesus Christ. He saw God the Father as a practicing wizard, as someone who is practicing folk magic. He saw God the Father and Jesus Christ standing side by side. And I cut off uh, the portion where they're showing their faces here because I didn't want to show an image of God the Father. But supposedly, he saw the Father and Jesus Christ according to him. However, we read in John chapter 1, verse 18, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. And again, in John chapter 6, verse 45 and 46, it is written in the prophets, They shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. And who's, who's he talking about there? Himself, right? So Joseph Smith saw the Father. What would have happened to, jo what would have happened to magic practicing Joseph Smith if he would have seen the Father? He would have been destroyed. He would have been destroyed by the brightness of his, of his righteousness and his glory. Paul? Well, Rita and I were talking about this the other day. Not just... That the father aside, Moses could not gaze upon the face of Jesus in his glory. He would have been consumed, right. let alone the father. Yes. However, who else saw them too? At least Jesus claimed in a cave. Ignatius Loyola. Oh, yes. Exact same blueprint. Wake up, Christians. Amen. Very interesting. Yeah, and actually that's one of the things I bring out here. Exodus chapter, no, it's fine. It means the Holy Spirit's guiding. Exodus chapter 33, verse 17 through 20. Now, this is, as Paul said, this is about seeing just Jesus' glory. Obviously, someone could see Jesus now because he is a man and he has a way of veiling his glory. That's what he did when he came here on earth. But before he incarnated, when he's dealing with Moses here, Moses couldn't even see his glory. Moses, was Moses practicing witchcraft? No. Moses was, if, if you will, the most righteous human being on earth at that time. Absolutely. A humble man. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy unto whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. But Joseph saw him. Joseph saw the Father and Jesus in their glory. The Father who dwells in light, unapproachable, what does that make him at this point if he's considered himself a prophet? 
Is that a true prophet or a false prophet? False prophet, but we're still going to go further. Remember, Moses, the only way he could even glimpse at the glory of Christ was when he was protected in the cleft of the rock. So we have the vision of 1823 now, a couple years later. In 1823, Joseph Smith had a strange dream where an angel appeared in his presence named Moroni, who disclosed the location of a buried book of golden plates and other artifacts, including a breastplate and seer stones, which could be used to interpret the book made of the golden plates. According to an interview with Joseph Smith's father, Joseph Smith Sr., the visitor in the vision was not an angel uh, at all, but an old man in bloody clothes. And the name was Nephi, and then later Moroni. And to find that out, that was actually printed way back in 1870 in a, in a historical magazine, an article by Fayette Lafemme, interview with the father of Joseph Smith, the, morning, the Mormon prophet, 40 years ago, his account of the findings of the sacred plates. Again, that's Historical Magazine, second series, uh, number seven, May 1870, page 305 through 309. So the story wasn't straight. At least the story that he told to his father is that an old ancient man named Nephi in bloody clothes who was covered in blood had been in that, in that vision. Later on, at some point, it, this got corrected and now it was an angel and who went by the name Moroni who had told him where these golden plates were and that there was information on the plates, that the plates themselves were actually a book that needed to be translated. And they were written in a language that no one understood that Joseph Smith described as Reformed Egyptian. So he would have to use the seer stones in order to look through and see the letters and the words of the golden plates and be able to translate. It wasn't until four years later that he finally retrieved the golden plates, or at least according to him, he retrieved them, because nobody ever saw them on display. They were never open to the public. The only, the only testimony that we have in regards to the plates are followers of Joseph Smith who say that they have seen them. So moving forward to 1826, we have the supernatural treasure hunter back at his tricks again. In 1826, Joseph Smith had to try to supplement his income to help the family after the death of his brother Alvin. Family members supplemented their meager farm income by hiring out for odd jobs and working as treasure seekers, a type of magical supernaturalism where they claimed basically the ability to be able to see treasure under the ground through one of these types of seer stones, right, that he had. So it's interesting that a seer stone would be part of Moroni's message as well. As a type of magical supernaturalism common during the period, Smith was said to have an ability to locate lost items by looking into the seer stone, which he also used in treasure hunting, including beginning in 1825, several unsuccessful attempts to find buried treasure sponsored by Josiah Stowell a wealthy far farmer in Chenango County, New York. Smith was brought before a Chenango County court for glass looking, which was against the law. It was, this was so prevalent at that time, folks, that it was actually against the law for you to claim to be a treasure hunter that can use supernatural means to find treasure. It was such a problem back then that it was actually part of New York law and you were considered um, a disorderly person, is what they would consider you, if you were doing that. So here we have Joseph Smith is now breaking the law in New York and working with somebody to try to find treasure. So it was called glass looking or pretending to find lost treasure. Stowell's relatives are the reason that um, Joseph Smith went to court because they accused Smith of tricking Stowell and faking an ability to perceive hidden treasure, though Stowell was still, still believed that he could. So it was actually Stowell's family that took him to court. So now we have someone who practices magic, who has seen the father, and who breaks the law of the land. 
And that's from Wikipedia on Joseph Smith. Oh, and by the way, this is how they would do it, because it was against the law. He would put his seer stone in his hat, and he would look through like this, so he, so he, didn't have, he wasn't holding the seer stone in his hand, so that the police wouldn't be, as ob it wouldn't be as obvious what he was doing. He would put it in his hat, and later on when he translated, when he translated the golden plates, he, um, he did the same thing. He put it in his hat. Again, from Wikipedia, Smith made his last visit to the hill that Maroney had told him to go to shortly after midnight on September 22, 1827, taking Emma, which was his first wife, with him. This time, he said he had successfully retrieved the plates. He said the angel commanded him not to show the plates to anyone else, but to translate them and publish their translation. Smith said the plates were a religious record. Now listen to this. This is, what, this is what was written on the plates that Maroney had to make sure that Joseph Smith got so that he could translate. He couldn't show the plates to anybody, but he had to translate this and then get it out. The, Smith said the plates were a religious record of Middle Eastern indigenous Americans. That means tribes of Israel lost tribes of Israel that were here that somehow made their way over here to the New World in the United States and were living as Indians. That was the belief. And actually when Jesus died on the cross, the three days that he was in the grave, he didn't actually stay in the grave. He came over here to the United States to preach the gospel to the other tribes. Are you tracking? <laughs> So it was a record of Middle Eastern indigenous Americans and were engraved in an unknown language called Reformed Egyptian. He also told, told associates that he was capable of reading and translating them. So quite interesting there. And not to get too far ahead of myself because we're going uh, to talk about this later, but there were light-skinned. All the tribes were kind of light-skinned. And then there were these tribes that decided that they were going to be evil. And so God cursed them by making their skin darker. Right? And eventually, the dark-skinned, evil Native Americans killed all the white-skinned Native Americans. And all that was left by the time the settlers came were the darker, brown-skinned Native Americans who were technically cursed by God. That was the story. So, continuing on. After initial hardships, with the translation of the Golden Plates, Joseph Smith met Oliver Cowdery in 1828, who also practiced folk magic and treasure hunting. It was with him that he completed the translation of the Golden Plates before they were taken away by the angel Moroni. Now, stopping there, the problems that he had with the translation of the Golden Plates originally were that he had moved in with his, uh, with, uh, not moved in, but he was using uh, his neighbor's help to sort of, who believed him, to sort of translate these, these messages. And he got, a lot of, he got a lot of papers translated. Eventually, the guy, his name was Harris, started to doubt if the Golden Plates actually existed and so what he did was he said, I want to take the writings and show them to a family member. And Joseph Smith agreed. And what he did was he lost the, the, the pages because he wanted to see if Joseph Smith would be able to retranslate them exactly the way they were before. But instead, Joseph Smith, very cunning man, he said that because the, because the pages were lost, that the angel Moroni had said that they cannot be retranslated. All right, so he continued to translate the rest of the golden plates with this other man, Oliver Cowdery. He was also a practicer of religious folk magic as well, and also a treasure hunter. The only other witnesses of the plates were other followers with sworn testimony totaling 11, three and then eight at two different times. 
The translation called for baptism and an institutional church in which Smith and Cowdery ba baptized each other. The completed translation called the Book of Mormon was published in 1830 along with the formation of the Church of Christ, which was the institution that they originally started. Mob violence was kindled against both Smith and Cowdery because of their past as fraudulent treasure hunters, and he was forced to flee New York shortly after the formation of the church. He also claimed to have had a vision of Peter, James, and John at this time calling himself, they were calling himself and Cowdery to a higher priesthood. And eventually they would use the Melchizedek priesthood to, uh, as a basis for, for what they were in comparison to the other people and what their commission was. So quite interesting, after this, some of Smith's followers and fellow leaders claimed that they had received special revelations and visions, including Hiram Page, who's the picture here, and Oliver Cowdery, who was the last picture. Shortly after, Smith received a revelation stating, no one shall be appointed to receive commandments and revelations in this church, excepting my servant Joseph, for he receiveth them even as Moses. And that's from uh, Richard Bushman, 2005, which we'll be quoting a lot from. Uh, Joseph Smith, Rough Stone Rolling, page 121. So quite interestingly, as the, the, the beginning of the church is starting, the Church of Christ, you have Cowdery and this other guy, Hiram Page, who are sort of the, the, the beginning co-founders with Joseph Smith. And they, who also practice folk magic, I don't know about Hiram Page, probably, but Cowdery did, they start having visions too, right? And so what, what does Joseph Smith do? Joseph Smith has another revelation and says, hey, guess what? God told me that you're, you guys don't have any authority at all, but only me, only I have the authority. So everything I say is from God, and everything you say might just be a delusion. Paul? You know what? This is a, this is a 19th century... Uh, Ron L. Hubbard story because this sounds like Scientology and how it was all science fiction yeah. and it was a joke but this guy wasn't joking and how it got started it's crazy it's crazy but he's the only prophet like Muhammad yes exactly actually he compares himself to Muhammad at one point from there, Cowdery and the others who had these revelations were sent to be missionaries to Native Americans and to locate the New Jerusalem where Cowdery met Sydney, a man named Sidney Rigdon who was converted in Ohio with hundreds of his followers. He had a bunch of followers himself. They were involved in uh, dropping on the ground and flopping around and doing trances and all sorts of very very uh, scary sort of charismatic stuff. Their leader was Sidney Rigdon. When he, was, when he was converted, everybody came with him, right? And he became a high leader in the church. And basically their numbers doubled when Cowdery met this man. But quite interestingly enough, the people that had basically um, looked to a, becoming more exalted member of the church by becoming perhaps prophets themselves, after Joseph Smith received this revelation which said, no, 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 just me, he sent them away to be missionaries while he maintained his foothold in the church. Quite interesting, huh? Heads I win, tails you lose. So from 1831 to 1838, they moved to Ohio while Cowdery was still out and about trying to find the New Jerusalem, which he was looking in Missouri for that. Due to the issues in New York, Joseph Smith called his followers to move together to Kirtland, or Kirtland, sorry, I spelled that wrong, Ohio, along with the new followers from Sidney Rigdon, which were known for extreme manifestations of spiritual gifts like speaking in tongues, going into trances and rolling on the ground. They were also communalists, which is the religious form of communism. So they, they actually had sympathy with... Uh, some of the ideals that came out of the French Revolution, particularly the communistic ideals, and that's how they lived. 
This was the religious form of communism. And this is where a lot of the arguments that come out of the Bible to try to prove communism comes from, is from groups like these. So they're a very early form of communism. Isn't that interesting? So each according to his ability, each according to their need, and they lived in a communal society. Kind of like a Jim Jones situation where everybody sort of lived together and they all had their work and they, nobody necessarily got paid for anything, right? But then they would, have, they would eat together and they would sing songs together and, and do that type of stuff. That was Sidney Rigdon's crew that he brought to the table. Cowdery found the New Jerusalem in Jackson County, Missouri, and Smith approved in 1831. However, a large numbers of Mormons in Kirtland excited more mob violence because they had different political views, and they were very, very forceful in how they would get their message out. They would say, basically try to push this Book of Mormon on people, and pe it didn't sit well with people. And if you can imagine being next to somebody who is, uh, you know, basically doing the floppy fish on the ground every morning, um, it, it can cause problems with the community. And that's what they did everywhere they went. This is what happened. So they uh, excited more mob violence, and Smith and Rigdon were beaten. They were tarred and feathered and left for dead in 1832. And again, that's Bushman, 2005, page 178 through 180. Very sad thing that had happened, but just because, something to keep in mind, just because you receive persecution doesn't mean you're the good guy, okay? There's all sorts of ways um, that we can go out of our way to make sure that we receive persecution. Even as Christians today, we can go find ways to make sure that we receive persecution. Um, that doesn't make us right to do that. You know, if a Satanist is out there and he's like uh, trying to take people's children and mutilate them uh, in front of the whole community, he's going to he's gonna invoke some persecution upon him too. That doesn't make him the good guy. So keep that in mind. So problems in Missouri for Smith, and then later again in Ohio. Due to political and religious differences, the residents of Jackson County eventually became violent as well. So this is what's going on. They're kind of, they have a split crew. They have this group in Ohio with a major group, which is with Joseph Smith. He comes down every now and again to see how Cowdery and the other, and the other small group of missionaries that he has sent out, how they're setting up their, basically the new Jerusalem down there in Missouri. Okay, so you have the two groups sort of split. But the residents of Jackson County eventually became violent as well. The Mormons were expelled and their property burned. Smith responded by telling the, Mich the Missouri Mormons to first bear the abuse patiently, and then he told them to take up arms. He supported their conflict by creating a group called Zion's Camp, which was a little military organization within his own Mormons. Okay, which failed successfully in defeating the Jackson County residents in their skirmishes. Also, a cholera outbreak occurred among the Mormons at this time as well. It doesn't look like God's smiling upon their efforts, does it? They formed this, they formed this uh, military organization to combat the residents of Jackson County, Missouri, and a cholera outbreak happens. They lose all their battles. Not, not, not in any way, shape, or form like Abraham, right? When Abraham found out that Lot was taken and he decided to go with his band of 314 guys. That was 314, right? I think it was. And, and he, defeated the, he defeated these armies, which was so obvious that it was God's intervention. Not here. That's not, that's not Joseph Smith's experience or the Mormon's experience. After this, more emphasis was placed on the Kirtland Temple by the church, uh, but the church was greatly in debt because they were uh, trying to build this temple, and that's what they call their churches, temples. And internal struggles became more pro prominent. When Cowdery was in town, he accused Smith of having a sexual relationship with a teenage servant in his home named Fanny Alger, A-L-G-E-R, Alger who later became one of Smith's plural wives. So later on, she was a teenager at this time when 
He was accused of the sexual relationship, but she did, in fact, become one of his wives later on. That's an allegation. Is it true? Who knows? Also, that's from Bushman, 2005, and you can read through basically page 247 through 328. This is a big summation here. So, in 1837, we still have this very young church. Smith and others went to Salem, Massachusetts on a treasure hunting excursion to combat their growing debt to try to pay for the Kirtland Temple. They had creditors basically bothering them uh, to get their money back, and they were trying to find a way to get some money. So Smith received a revelation from God that he, that is God, had, quote, much treasure in this city, talking about Salem, Massachusetts. And you can read that again in Bushman, page 328. But he returned to Ohio with nothing. Isn't that interesting? Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 22, it says, When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. So he said that there was treasure in the city, yet he came back empty-handed. He said that the new Jerusalem was going to be over here, but their property was burned, and so they began focusing on Ohio. So we have a, basically we have a, a, a prophet, so-called, who practices magic. Even to this day, at this point in time, he's practicing magic. He has some heavy allegations against him. He's, a, he's, in, he's up to his eyeballs in debt. He doesn't make good business decisions. He breaks the law. And his, his things that he promises as a prophet, his visions, his revelations, they do not come to pass. That's who Joseph Smith is right now. Again, from Wikipedia on Joseph Smith, it says, In January 1837, Smith and other church leaders created a joint stock company called the Kirtland Safety Society Anti-Banking Company to act as a quasi-bank. The, the company issued bank notes partly capitalized by real estate. Smith encouraged the Latter-day Saints to buy the notes in which he invested heavily in himself. The bank failed within a month. Does that sound like God is working through this man? Does God want you to set up a business that's going to fail in a month? As a result, the Latter-day Saints in Kirtland suffered extreme price vol volatility, volatility and intense pressure from debt collectors. Smith was held responsible for the failure, and there were widespread defections from the church, including many of Smith's closest advisors. After a warrant was issued for Smith's arrest on the charge of banking fraud, Smith and Rigdon fled Kirtland for Missouri in January 1838. So now they're running from the law in, in addition to being fraudulent bankers and having everything that they try fail, militarizing, and of course they are still practicing magic at this point. More extreme, more violence. By 1838, the Mormons had moved back to Missouri, but this time much further west. At this time, their name was changed to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It was this time in 1838. Internal dissenters were removed, and that's what they were called, dissenters, including Cowdery and other members, because Cowdery had, had uh, leveled the accusation against him in Ohio, and he had tried to have revelations on his own, so Cowdery had to go. They became known as dissenters. A man named one of his followers, Samson Avard, formed an internal group called the Danites, who were tasked with intimidating Mormon members who were seen to be out of line with the church or with Joseph Smith and willing to take up arms against anti-Mormon groups. So they were a, a basically a paramilitary group within the organization that was also meant to enforce and keep in line the people. Does that sound like God's church to you? These Danites, and what a name to pick out of everybody, about all the groups. This is, this is the tribe 
that is not included in the tribes listed in Revelation as those who will be redeemed, the Danites. They were later called avenging angels. Hostilities broke out between the Missourians and the Mormons called the 1838 Mormon War. By accident, the Mormons and the Danites attacked a Missouri state militia. Whoops. Does that sound like they're being led by God? They accidentally attacked a governmental entity and caused the governor, Lilburn Boggs, who ordered that the Mormons be, quote, exterminated or driven from the state. Missourians surprised and killed 17 Mormons in what was later called the Hans Mill Massacre, which they used as a playing card later. Eventually, the Mormons surrendered to 2,500 Missouri militia. And again, that's Bushman from page 300 to 365. <clears throat> How am I on time, Pastor Hughes? Four? Okay. Now, on the run from the law again. Smith was tried with treason and sentenced to death, but was granted a hearing by the state, but charged with treason when dissenters, that's Cowdery and the others, testified against him. <clears throat> he was then held in the Liberty, Missouri jail for four months. At this time, he repented of his endorsement of the Danites and now counseled his followers to avoid hostilities with non-Mormons. Meanwhile, Brigham Young rose to prominence when he successfully moved 14,000 Mormons to Illinois and Iowa. In April of 1839, after a grand jury hearing in Davis County, Smith escaped from custody. It is widely believed he did this by bribing the guards with whiskey and money. Again, same source, page 375. This is a crazy story, isn't it? Does this sound like the Lord's hand bringing people you know, out of Egypt, like, like with Moses? Does this sound like God's hand is in any aspect, any part of this work? You know what this sounds like? This sounds like if you had taken a bunch of teenage kids and you had dropped them off in the woods and you said, you are your own government. We'll be back in a month. This is what you would find. This insanity. From there, they moved to, to Illinois as he fled Missouri. Again, Bushman 360 to 411. Life in Nauvoo, Illinois, was better at first because of the disgust of the parts of the nation with the event at Hans Mill Massacre. When, they were, when 17 of them were killed. Illinois accepted the Mormons as residents because of this. Smith unsuccessfully petitioned the federal government for reparations for their mistreatment. Yes, yes he did. <laughs> the summer of 1839 saw a malaria epidemic in, the, in Nauvoo while Brigham Young was led a successful mission to Europe. And a lot of people were converted in Europe, particularly in England, mostly poor but many converts. In Illinois, Smith converted John C. Bennett, who's the picture here, the Illinois quartermaster who gave Smith and the Mormons city autonomy, habeas corpus control of Nauvoo, that way he couldn't be extradited to Missouri, and allowed them to form their own militia, which found Bennett and Smith as its generals. How about that? So Joseph Smith was the major general, and just below him, Lieutenant General Bennett. Bennett also became a leading official in the church and the first mayor of Nauvoo. Again, same source, 360 to page 411. And it looks like we're just about out of time, so I'm going to close here, and we'll have to continue this next time. Have they never read with their forming of their militias, and by the way, after this, jo uh, Joseph Smith wore a general's garment until the day he died, when he, when he became the leader of Nauvoo, Illinois. Matthew chapter 26, verse 50 through 52, it says, And Jesus said unto him, Friend, where art thou come? 
and they came and then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priests and smote off his ear. That's when Peter cut off Malchus's ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. And here you have the Mormons constantly taking up the sword. We have a little bit more to go. We have basically the final years of Joseph Smith's life in Nauvoo, Illinois. And judging from what you've seen and all the violence that you've seen so far, I can promise you it doesn't change from here. There will be more violence. There will be more bloodshed. Uh, and there will be more insanity. This is the origin story of the Mormons. This is really not contested history either. So, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to study and to learn and to compare the Bible, which is a light unto our feet, and a lamp unto our path that we can see through the lies of the enemy and his minions that he has out there. See through the lies of the, of the false doctrines by comparing them with your truth, with your word. Thank you for that, Lord. Help us to study like we never have before that we might be able to discern and know what is your will for our lives. Please help us be with us throughout the rest of this week. Be with us the rest of the Sabbath. And we're so grateful, Lord, to be called your sons and your daughters because of what Jesus has done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.